It's been a crazy wildfire season. Um, and I just, you know, I got curious about, you know, what it actually takes to put out some of these fires. Hey James, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Yeah, thanks Eric, thanks for having me on. I know that you're a fire officer with BC Wildfire Service. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, um, I guess I'm kind of in my 25th, 26th year of fighting fire. I manage the Fort St. John Fire Zone, as well as I operate and run the smoke jumper program in British Columbia, which is called Paratac. So I pulled out some videos for us to watch together and I'm hoping you can help me break down some of these techniques. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, so let, let's, let's play a video here. I see staff that work for me. Um, they're suiting up. Wait, are you, are you part of this crew right now? That's me in the picture right there. That was me, if you go back. Wait, man. wait, wait a second. I gotta, I gotta go back. Which one is you, this one? You'll see me spotting there. Keep going. That's you right there. Right, yep, that's me yeah. right there. You bet. And what, look at this looks frightening. What what, what <laughs> why is this necessary right now? Just sticking okay, so his head the out there. Yeah. The spotter has to look outside of the aircraft due to the position of the wing on the yeah. DC three. In order to see where you're planning to exit the aircraft, you need to be able to look under the wing of the aircraft. What we want to do is is we want to put the aircraft directly over top of the exit point. Um, where we want the actual jumpers to go. We don't want to be close, we want to be bang on. And then there's a moment where, you know, you jump out, look at this, this is great. Mm -hmm. This is such a cool angle. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, after the noise of the aircraft, you get out of the plane, um, plane flies away, parachutes open, you locate usually your stick partner, make sure there's no conflicts in the air where you would have any sort of mid-air collision risks or any of that kind of stuff. Mm, okay. And, you know, as we continue to watch here, like why, why is this particular method of smoke jumping, why is it effective for trying to contain wildfires? This method is useful for a lot of reasons, but one of the main reasons is speed range and payload. So if we have resources in our location, which say is Fort St. John, um, and there's a fire in Southern British Columbia, which is, you know, a thousand or 1200 kilometers away from us, it's totally reasonable that we can get the dispatch and be on site within two hours to respond to that fire. So t tell me what you see here. Yeah, I see, uh, looks like an Ericsson Sky Crane there flying in Los Angeles. Yeah, and basically tanking, dropping water on a fire. Well, you can just identify the kind of plane just by looking at it from that far. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's an S-4, <laughs> yeah, Sky Crane, yeah, you bet. Um, so yeah, so that would basically be used in initial attack operations, but a lot of heavy helicopters are used to support large incidents, especially around communities. Um, they can work in steep terrain. Uh, they carry large volumes of, uh, of fluid on board. You know, in some cases they would use retardant, other cases foam, other cases just water. Um, I think I believe their standard drop is around 2,400 gallons. Wow, That's what you look see. at that. That's um, a lot of water, wow. That is, that is a lot of water, you bet. And in terms of like its effectiveness, because we see in that video, all that water just lands right over the fire. Can it, can water bombing actually put out uh, a fire like that? Generally, the answer is no. Um, so water bombers are allowing you to get the fire out of the, you know, I would call it the canopy, um, which would be, you know, putting the fire that's at the top of the trees, getting it down to the ground, changing the relative humidity in the area in order that the actual fire behavior changes to where crews on the ground can get there and action the fire. They don't extinguish fire, That they, they don't do that at all. What they do is they allow, um, they, can change, they change the conditions of the fire so that firefighters can get in there and actually extinguish the fire. So uh, what, what is happening here? Yep. Yeah. So the crews are obviously building a control line or a hand line. Um, some would call it a hand guard. This specific hand tool is called a Pulaski. Um, it's kind of a combination, almost like hoe and ax head. Um, it allows you to break up the organic layer on the surface of the ground, remove that organic layer and get you to mineral soil. And that This looks like a ton of work. This it looks is like really difficult work. 
It is absolutely a ton of work. Yeah, you bet it is. And it, uh, it's kind of where the rubber hits the road in our business. It's, you know, like we say, what you see right there is they're either digging up a hot spot. That's what it looks like to me. They're basically breaking it up and uh, digging it up. And they would call grubbing it out, grubbing the hot spot out. So it's kind of hot, dirty, smoky work. This is kind of what you would call a, a bit of an indirect attack method. Um, we build these lines, you know, well in advance of the fire. Um, ideally, um, so that the crews can do that in a safe location. And then when the fire, when we anticipate the fire arriving, then they could go, can go ahead with ignition operations and maintain that kind of safe control line. And we hit up the What's happening here with the canisters? Yeah, so those are, are handheld drip torches is what they are. So those are what the crews, we just talked about them building a control line. And then we talk about them actual burning off or uh, doing ignition operations from them. And that's exactly what that's doing right now. If you've ever walked in a forest and you can tell that all the needles are on the ground and all the little dead sticks, um, those are all surface fuels. We refer to all any sort of thing that can burn on the ground as fuel. And those little surface fuels, they're the stuff that when a spark hits, um, that's what gets the fire going. We're trying to burn in places that are an advantage for us, not where it's an advantage for the fire. There's a lot of anxiety, obviously, about you know, wildfires um, and feeling as though there are more and more these days. You know, you're, you're someone, obviously, you're very close to the work and you're in it every day. You know, what, what do you make of all of it? Yeah, I would think from when I started out on the cruise to where we are now, we have far more fire in the landscape than we have in, you know, in the last five decades. Um, we have a lot of forest ecosystem health issues out there. And uh, right now we do have an, an immense amount of fuel on the ground out there that is kind of dead, dried and, and, you know, really prepped to burn. Mother Nature has kind of prepped these forests for burning. Um, you add in slightly warmer or warmer temperatures, which I do think we can broadly say is happening. Um, where we used to get rain sooner, we're not getting them. It takes longer for that rain to come. And then the number one thing too is we have people everywhere. Um, even 50, 40, 50 years ago, not everyone had a cabin on every lake out there. We didn't have cell towers everywhere. It's uh, it's definitely changed environment and I don't anticipate it being reduced in the next five to 10 years. I see our, our uh, fire regime increasing at the rate of, it's been increasing um, probably within the next five or 10 years. James, thank you so much for taking the time to talk. Really insightful, appreciate it, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I appreciate the opportunity and happy to talk anytime about these things. <laughs>